Welcome everyone. Just going to wait another minute or so as we're as people are joining us. Still a few more people trickling in. All right, looks like we're kind of getting to mass capacity. A few more people are coming in, but um, welcome everyone. Uh, I see already there's a quick question about recording. So yes, I'd like, uh, I'll let everybody know that this webinar is being recorded uh, so that we can share it with everybody else who wasn't able to make it. Um, so just a heads up on that. Um, all right. So welcome. It's great to see everybody, or not see your faces, of course, but see that everybody's here. Uh, my name is Anya Fetcher. I'm the State Director of Envi Environment Maine. Uh, we're a uh, citizen-based environmental advocacy organization, and uh, we work on our staff works to protect clean air, clean water, and uh, advocate for clean energy and a livable planet. So we work on a number of issues from protecting our bees from uh, toxic pesticides to tackling climate change and uh, working to reduce plastic pollution and the waste that we produce in this world. So um, uh, we're joined today by Vanessa Berry with Environment Maine, or sorry, <laughs> with Eco Maine, the other something Maine. Uh, sorry about that. So Vanessa Berry with Eco Maine, uh, and we're going to do a little bit of uh, talking trash, as we like to say. Uh, before we really get started, a reminder that once again, this is being recorded. Uh, if you have questions for myself or Vanessa during the webinar, please use the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to submit questions like that. Uh, and then if you are having an issue like a, a technical difficulty or a question about that, uh, you can send a message to myself, Anya Fetcher, um, in the chat option at the bottom of your screen and I'll do my very best to help you out. Um, so questions in the Q&A and concerns or issues in the chat to Anya. Um, all right, so we'll get started then. So many of you are already aware that the issue of waste is a big one. Um, here at Environment Maine, we like to say that, you know, nothing we use for five minutes should be able to pollute the environment for hundreds of years to come. Uh, these days, we are finding uh, plastic, uh, primarily from single-use single plastics, uh, everywhere from our waterways to, you know, the stomachs of, of animals and even to the point of learning that we humans consume up to a credit card's worth of plastic per week. Uh, so plastic is everywhere at this point. Uh, there are very few places where it hasn't gotten into uh, our environment and it is pervasive. So we are here to talk about uh, how 
some of the ways that we can work to reduce not only the plastic that makes its way into our environment once it's produced, but also to reduce uh, the production of plastic to begin with. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Vanessa with EcoMaine. Awesome, thank you, Anya, um, and happy to be here. Uh, my name is Vanessa Berry, and I am an environmental educator for EcoMaine. Um, for folks who are unfamiliar with EcoMaine, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to who we are and what we do um, in our facilities at large. Um, and then we're really gonna, you know, jump right into a virtual tour of the facilities um, and talk about how policies and, you know, behavior change and all of that stuff can really help, um, you know, mitigate plastic pollution and, um, and really, you know, reduce that stuff from, from entering our environment or existing in the first place. Um, you know, so I'll get started. And if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q and A. Um, I am happy to answer questions about, you know, the logistics of recycling. Um, and I'll have my contact information at the end of the presentation as well. So if you have any burning questions that just like don't get answered today, um, feel free to use that uh, contact info, reach out to me, um, and I will be happy to provide you with all the resources that we have at our disposal. So um, without further ado, I'll get started um, and, and keep those questions coming. So EcoMaine is a municipally owned 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, so we do things a little differently compared to some of our other waste management companies, um, even in the, you know, in the state of Maine or throughout the country. Um, we are owned by Maine municipalities. We have 20 of them. Um, I'll tell you who those are in just a few minutes. Um, but we manage municipal solid waste, so your household garbage, and your single sort recycling. Um, we were actually the first organization in the state of Maine to bring single sort technology to the state um, with all of our innovative uh, equipment and sorting technologies. And you'll see all of that in the virtual tour today. We have three facilities that we operate. Um, we're located right in the greater Portland area. We're right on outer Congress street in Portland over by the jet port. So you may have noticed us there or maybe not. And that's, that's always a good thing too. Um, we have three facilities that we that we operate. Um, the first one is our waste to energy power plant. So your household waste comes into our facility. Um, it burns at about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So we combust that trash, turn it into ash. Um, so we're reducing what is sent to landfill by about 90%. Um, and then we also are creating electricity from that trash. So um, through the combustion of waste, we have steam turbines that we operate. We have pipes of water in our boilers. So we burn that trash at 2000 degrees and makes steam. The steam powers the turbines. The turbines um, are powered to a generator and we make about 100, um, 100,000 megawatt hours of electricity, which powers our facilities, um, our electric cars, our fleet of electric vehicles. Um, and we put the extra back into the grid where it can power up to 15,000 homes just with people's household garbage. Um, now, of course, we don't want everything thrown away. So we've got some other strategies for disposal. Um, so we've got our single sort recycling facility, which manages all sorts of different types of commodities. And I'll show you all of those in the virtual tour to come. Um, we take about 35,000 tons of recycling into our facility every year um, from towns all over the state of Maine. And we take about 175,000 tons of trash. Um, and we're at about capacity right now. We don't really have much room for more garbage or for more communities to get on board. Um, so the best thing to do is to reduce the disposal of, of items and find better uses for that stuff um, to really keep that, that uh, facility operational and allow us to help more towns um, process and manage their trash rather than sticking it all in a hole in the ground and burying it for the next generation. Um, we also operate our own landfill space. Um, because we combust the trash, we also, you know, kind of lovingly call it our ash fill. Um, so that's where we store uh, the, you know, the residue from that combustion process. And that's um, just a couple miles down the street from us. So we're uh, located on Outer Congress, kind of tucked away. Um, you hardly would know we're there. And our landfill is tucked away, kind of quiet, not very smelly anymore. Um, but, you know, we're silently managing your waste in the greater Portland area. Now, um, map of our service area here 
if uh, if you don't mind, use the chat to let us know where you're coming from. So, you know, quickly introduce yourselves. Tell us where you're coming from. Um, are you in an eco main community or is your stuff going somewhere else? It's really helpful for me to know. Um, so feel free to use the chat to let us know, um, you know, what town you're coming from and if you're an ecomaniac and all that good stuff. Awesome. And I, I always love to see, you know, a wide array of folks coming from all over the state. So that's really exciting. See somebody from Bar Harbor and Belfast and Cumberland and Portland. Someone from Bath, but they're currently in Arizona. That's awesome. Get some warmer weather over there. Southwest Harbor, New Harbor. Um, somebody asked about the different colored dots on the map. Um, so our green dots on this map, so places like Gorham and Hollis and Limington, Portland, South Portland, Cape, those are our owner communities. So those are the 20 towns that are represented on our board of directors. Um, you know, we have public works directors, uh, uh, town managers, um, sustainability coordinators, all representing the board of directors here at EcoMaine. They make all of our decisions. Um, and that's a, you know, kind of one example of why we do things a little differently. Um, you know, our board of directors is really thinking long term because these are, you know, their communities. They want to take care of them and foster them for the years to come. Um, and so they're not just looking at, you know, if we dispose of things in a landfill, it's going to be the cheapest option. They're looking at, you know, how long do we have our landfill for? Um, we can't rely on those systems forever. We need to find better alternatives to, to manage waste and reduce waste. Um, and so one of the really great things is that our board is very supportive of education. And so um, thus my position was born. Um, so there's actually three environmental educators here at EcoMain that are responsible for doing outreach and education about diversion strategies um, and really getting, getting folks to participate in recycling programs um, and all of that stuff. So our board is very concerned with that. Um, the, the blue dots on the map here are associate communities. So they have contracts with us for over 25 years. So they're committed for a long haul, um, but they're not owners, um, just shy. They've, they've been around for a while since the, uh, pretty much since the uh, single sort technology came into the plant. So back in 2006, they, they committed for the long term to be with us. Um, and then the yellow blips on the map, those are our contract members. So those ones can vary every three to five years. Um, so if that's, hopefully that's helpful. If you live in one of these towns, maybe that gives you a better understanding. Um, and also when contracts come up for bid, um, you know, they have some options on the table as to where they can send their waste. Um, if you live in one of these contract communities, maybe find out when that date is, um, because we of course want folks to advocate to putting their materials to better and higher uses. Um, and that's usually when those conversations happen. So that's a good opportunity to get involved right there. Um, I haven't even gotten to that part in the presentation yet. So awesome. I'm seeing lots of different towns, um, Brunswick, Bangor, um, some communities from EcoMaine, some not, um, but very excited and, and lucky to have all of you in here. Um, okay, we'll move on though. So the first thing we want to do is we want to test your knowledge on what's acceptable in our single sort recycling program. Just kind of a little quiz to see, you know, what do you think is recyclable in our program and what, what do you think is not recyclable? Um, and hopefully you'll get all of those answers throughout the virtual tour. So feel free to put those in the poll. So I've launched a poll for those of you who are not as familiar. There should be a, a window that popped up uh, for you to be able to answer. Um, and go ahead and just mark which items you think are recyclable with EcoMain's single sort. And then we'll take a look in a minute. Results are coming in. Yeah, they're pretty quick. All right. I think we're getting some consensus on some items. <laughs> Definitely. See, 100%. <laughs> All right, waiting for a couple more people to vote, and then we'll close the polling. And take a look at what people thought. Yeah, and I've got All the right. answers at the end. I have a slide that kind of, you know, spills all the beans, so. That's right. Okay, I'm going to close the polling, and we're going to take a look at what people thought. Okay. 
So I think we so, had some consensus on milk cartons, laundry detergent jugs. These are over 50, uh, 50, 60 percent. Um, magazines, a hundred percent. I think we've got some confidence there. <laughs> um, and then we've got, you know, I think laundry laundry. detergent jug, pretty. Yep. Pretty that looks pretty everybody. good. Yep. All right. So we'll, we'll give you all the answers in a little bit, but try to keep those in mind as we're going through the facility. So you can see, um, you know, and try to, you know, make sense of the why we might take certain things over other things. So hopefully the virtual tour will explain everything. Um, but if we don't, then feel free to add questions. Um, you know, it's a good, good opportunity there. Yes. And um, reminder, as I said in the chat, to use the Q&A option for your questions. It's easier for us to track and then, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. All right. We'll power through. All right. So from, um, you know, however the material gets to EcoMain, um, it, uh, the process is going to be different for every town. It depends on their contract and what's available to them. Um, some folks have uh, residential curbside with automated trucks, which is really efficient and it keeps the driver safe in their car uh, and only get and it also is a little bit more efficient than like a transfer station where everyone drives there during the weekend. So they're all driving there and back. Um, the curbside collectors, they go through a route one time. Um, they've got these robotic arms so that they can stay safely in the trucks. Um, dump their recycling in one compartment in the back of their truck. Um, and then the trash goes into another compartment. So um, really cool technology. It's, it's, we're seeing it in more and more towns. Um, this is a vi that video right there was from a South Portland collection, but you might also have different processes for getting your stuff collected. Um, Eco Maine doesn't have their own fleet of trucks. So usually a town will contract with another vendor to do that service, um, just in case people had questions about that. Um, so you might have a manual collection where somebody's hanging off the back of the truck and they manually dump all of that stuff out. Um, you know, if you live in like a town like Kennebunkport uh, or Woolwich or something like that, um, they do manual collection of their recycling carts uh, at the curb or you might have to um, bring your stuff to a drop-off location. So uh, these containers right here, we call those the EcoMain Silver Bullets. Um, we have those scattered around through a lot of our towns. Um, and those are just a way for folks to drop off at their convenience, um, or if they have overflow recycling one week and their curbside can't pick up all of that stuff, they can bring their extra cardboard boxes or their extra stuff to one of these containers and they get brought to our facility. Um, no matter how it gets to us, it gets sorted and processed the exact same way. Um, so once it arrives to our facility, it gets dumped out on our tipping hall floor. And as you can see, it makes a giant mess. Um, and what you don't see in this video is we actually have somebody that stands on the floor of the tipping hall that grades each load of recycling as it comes in. Um, and what he's looking for, um, the guy's name is Ian. And Ian assesses the loads of recycling that come in. He walks around. Um, he's looking for any contamination. So he's looking for items like um, tarps or shoes or um, food waste. Maybe there's some, you know, a, a pizza in there. You never know. Um, so you name it, we've seen just about everything in the facility, um, but he's really got to keep his eyes peeled to keep the plant safe because we can also get things like propane tanks and batteries um, and really long rope that can get tangled in our equipment. Um, and he's gonna keep his eye, eyes peeled for anything that might cause folks harm in the facility. Um, you know, one lithium ion battery can start a fire in our facility that could take us out. Um, and then we wouldn't be able to recycle anything for anyone. Um, so it's really important that folks know the rules of the recycling and keep things clean. Um, but we do have somebody out there that's, you know, sole job is to really make sure that items that are going through the equipment are safe to go through the equipment. Um, we actually did have a lithium ion battery fire about a month ago. Um, it burned in the facility for several hours. I, I, if I counted correctly, we had over 15 fire trucks here in, as it happened. Um, and that's a really scary situation for us. Um, and, and you know, the whole point of us being around is to recover material and put it to a better and higher use, but we can't do that if our facility doesn't exist. Um, so we need everyone's help with that. And I know most of you are probably very diligent recyclers, um, but that's why it's all the more important to, to follow the rules and, uh, and to know the rules before you put items in the bin. So from here, our front loader scoops up the material, puts it onto a conveyor belt, 
we level everything out with a drum feeder. Um, and from there, it takes about three minutes to sort each item into the right container. So we're sorting out the commodities by type. So cardboard goes in one place, our metals go in one place, um, our plastics all get sorted out by numbers. Um, and so from here, it takes three minutes for him to do that or for the equipment to do that. So super fast, faster than my presentation. Um, from here, we use a, a series of rubber stars to sort out our cardboard and our paper. Um, now the cardboard sorting screen, the rubber stars are about the size of a tire. Um, so those are really big and they've got quite a bit of space separating them. Um, and so things are supposed to fall through and then the cardboard is light, fluffy and flat. It's gonna float over the top of that screen um, and get sorted out at the end. Um, but what you can see, even in this video clip right now, is that things like plastic films, which are not recyclable at Ecomain, um, or, you know, plastic strapping or clothing, um, bed sheets, that sort of stuff, um, gets tangled up in this equipment as it's trying to sort, and it makes it much less effective at doing its job. Yeah, you, it, I don't know if you guys caught it, but there's also a bag of garbage that went over that screen, too, if you had your eyes peeled. Um, you can see some of those things that are definite no-nos in our recycling facility um, that we've got to deal with. Now from here, this is our uh, paper sorting screen. So our paper sorting screen um, is at a little bit of an incline. The rubber stars are quite a bit smaller, uh, but the process is generally the same. So there's space in between each star so that things like metal, glass, and plastics can fall through, go onto another conveyor belt down below and keep on going through the plant while the paper is gonna pop up and over the top and go on its own conveyor belt to go into a baler by itself. So it looks a little chaotic, it's very noisy. So one of the luxuries of doing the virtual tour is you don't have to deal with all the sound, um, but it's really effective at sorting out paper, um, not so effective at sorting out those plastic bags, as I mentioned. So in just a second, you'll get a really good view of what things like single use plastic bags um, and those plastic films and flexible packaging can do in a facility like ours. So here's all the paper coming out. It looks pretty good, but then you'll get a, a glimpse here. This is all the plastic bags, plastic strapping, textiles, all of that stuff getting wound up in our equipment. And if we're not careful here, this is another opportunity where the friction from all of that interacting in our equipment could start a fire. Um, you know, those you know, those are not safe situations. And, and ultimately, it's not really helping the equipment do its job either. So items are supposed to be able to fall through, but as they get gunked up more and more with plastic bags, unfortunately, nothing can fall through because there's no space. So it doesn't really do a very good job when it's gunked up like that. So eventually, we'll have to shut down the equipment and send some of our staffers in there with box cutters to manually cut out the material that's, that's tangled up. Um, I had a student once use a really good example. It's kind of like your vacuum cleaner. When you lose suction in your vacuum cleaner, you unplug it, you flip it over, there's hair, there's string. So you have to go in with scissors, chop it all out and untangle it, unwind it a little bit, and then you're good to go. But a little bit of a nuisance, so not ideal. So, it, you know, on a similar note, talking about trash, um, so any contamination, you know, we get everything from dirty diapers to food waste, We've gotten chainsaws, samurai swords, wedding dresses, um, propane tanks, you name it, we've seen it. Um, all of that stuff needs to be removed by hand when it gets into our facility. Um, our top five contaminants, we actually check in on this quarterly with our recycling management and just make sure that we're all on the same page about what items are coming in. Um, sometimes they're seasonal. So like in the winter time, we get a lot of tanglers, we get Christmas lights in particular, because people have lots of questions about how to get rid of those. Um, you know, in the fall, our food waste might look a little bit more like jack-o-lanterns um, or, or yard waste. Um, in the spring, we get garden hoses, uh, all of this stuff. It, you know, there are similar themes. We get plastic bags and bagged recycling all year long but we get food waste, we get styrofoam, that's another problem. Um, so thankfully in July, we're gonna have a styrofoam ban for a lot of those containers. Um, so hopefully we won't see as much of that anymore. Um, and in July, we'll also see a single use plastic bag ban. So we're really excited to see what that could look like for our equipment. It could maybe um, have a real impact on, you know, all of that stuff getting tangled up in our, in our axles as they're trying to sort out material. 
Um, but we also get textiles and then what we would call the tanglers. So that's, you know, the rope, the chains, the string lights, all of that stuff that would get tangled in the equipment. All right, the next thing we sort out is our metals. So we have two different types of metals and two different types of metal sorting equipment. Our ferrous metals, so steel cans and that sort of thing, um, get pulled out by a magnet. So it's very much like Toy Story 3. If you've ever seen that movie, I've got a little gif of it in the corner. Um, but the magnet has a conveyor belt suspended around it. So the cans get stuck to the magnet, but the conveyor belt will drag it in the direction it wants to go. And then the magnet ends and it releases the soup can into the right container. Um, you can see it's super powerful. We've got some lids that were stuck to the top of that too. Um, and then for our non-ferrous metals, things like aluminum foil, pie plates, soda cans, all that sort of stuff, um, it gets repelled by a reverse eddy current, which sends an electromagnetic field to repel the aluminum in the opposite direction. Um, and so it's basically shooting hoops with your soda cans down this little chute over here. It does a pretty good job, but again, just a reminder that containers really have to be empty to be recyclable because otherwise, you know, that little projection is not going to send it where it needs to go. If there's any food in there, or anything, you know, remaining in those containers, we really need to make sure that they're empty so that they can go where they need to go in the facility. Then from there, we have our glass. Um, now, I always kind of start this slide off by disclaiming glass is super valuable just as it is. So reuse as much as humanly possible. Um, I am an avid container reuser. I kind of hold on to all of them like they're my precious little things. Um, and I use them for pencil cups. I use them for, um, you know, making my own candles. I Whatever project I can use glass for, I'm on it. Um, so I highly encourage folks to do the same, you know, donate them to a container library. If you've got a refill store near you, um, that's always a great alternative, um, but use that glass as much as possible. Um, but if you are unable to use that glass um, and have to recycle it, we break the glass in a closed metal system. We have metal stars, just like our rubber stars to sort our paper, um, but the metal stars are really skinny. They don't have much room underneath for things to fall through. So the job of the metal stars is to shatter glass and shatter it enough so it can fall through the screen. Um, and then we have plastics and those are the last thing to go through. They're gonna float over that screen because there's no way they're gonna fall through all of the rubbers, uh, the metal stars. So the metal stars are, sh uh, you know, really shattering the glass. We crush it up in a, in, and additionally kind of ground it down in a trommel until they're the right size. And then we store that for reuse. So I know um, regionally speaking in New England, it's really hard to find markets for recycling glass bottles and jars and turning them into new glass products. So again, use them if you can, um, but if you can't just know that EcoMain's facility, all the glass that comes into us gets repurposed for like construction projects. Um, our bathroom countertops are actually made with our broken glass. We use concrete as the base and they've made a really lovely countertop out of recycled bottles and jars. Um, so we have ways to repurpose that stuff. Um, I know that's not true of all facilities and some places are just saying to throw it away. Um, but I think glass is super valuable just the way that it is and try to find somebody who has a use for it if you don't also have a use for it. So um, yeah, that's my little tidbit there. The last one that we sort out and certainly the one that brings up the most questions is our plastics. I'm gonna pause this so I can come back to it. Um, plastics have what we call a resin code. Um, so if you look inside the recycling symbol on most plastics, there's going to be a number one through seven in there. Um, so number one is polyethylene terephthalate. Number two is high density polyethylene. Um, number three is polyvinyl chloride. So they all have different chemical compositions that help them do their jobs. Um, some are probably more long-term, more durable, more sturdy than others. Some are meant for single use, take, use, and throw away. Um, so we want to encourage folks to use plastics, you know, with discretion. Just kind of think before you buy and, and try to buy, you know, some plastics over other types of plastics. There are some that are easier to recycle than others. Um, so for example, across the state of Maine, a lot of folks aren't able to recycle three through seven plastics. Um, they you know, some of them have mixed resins in them. They get, you know, a little bit of five and a little bit of seven mixed in there. Um, and so that makes it really difficult for some places to, to find homes for this stuff. 
Um, EcoMain is really lucky. We've got buyers for all of our different types of plastics. We have homes for the stuff to turn into new things, but that's not always the case with every facility. So, um, you know, another, another reason to, to kind of advocate within your communities um, and also, you know, to, to look at those labels before you think about maybe, you know, if I have two choices and one comes in a more sustainable package than the other one, I want to go for the more sustainable if I can. Um, and we'll talk about how policy could help that too. Um, but we have the different resin codes. Number one is the most common um, for us. It's also that single use plastic. Um, so what we use for sorting technology here, because it comes in all different shapes and sizes, um, we use an optical sorter. So it scans the plastic um, and is programmed to look for the resin code that it's programmed to look for. So in this case, it's programmed to find number one PET plastic. Uh, when it sees the PET um, based on the chemistry of the plastic, it's going to send a puff of air to sort and separate that from the rest of the pile. Um, now from there, the rest of the plastics, the numbers two through seven, are going to go through this sorting line that you can see here in the bottom left picture. Um, that sorting line, uh, we've got folks that are manually sorting out our plastic milk jugs, our laundry detergent bottles, our yogurt cups, and so on and so forth. Um, so those are all pulled out by hand. So I'll show you a quick video of our optical sorter in action. It's really, really fast. Um, so if you <laughs> aren't watching carefully, you might miss it. Um, this is kind of looking in the opposite direction, but it just turned. Anything going straight up is getting that puff of air. I might play it one more time. I feel like it's so short. <laughs> you always miss it. Um, so yeah, it starts coming the other way, but you can also see how fast these conveyor belts have to move in order to process everything um, that we're getting into our facility. Vanessa, while we're watching it again, uh, we have just a couple quick questions from people um, that I thought I'd throw out there. Um, somebody's asking, uh, where does the recycled plastic go to be repurposed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it depends um, on, you know, it might depend on the month or the week or, um, you know, what, who's, who's taking what at one point in time. Um, so we have different buyers for, you know, our number one PET and they might vary from week to week. Um, but I will say for the most part, all of our plastics and most of our other stuff, um, I think with the exception of paper, you know, as it is, uh, stays right here in the United States, right along the Eastern seaboard of the United States, which is really great because it supports domestic jobs. It supports, um, you know, do domestic solutions for recycling, which we desperately need. Um, I know that's not true of most facilities. A lot of places were very dependent on China for recycling their plastics. Um, and, and we were very fortunate that that was not the case. Um, cause when China removed themselves from the recycling markets and they said that they weren't going to take exports anymore, that really hurt a lot of, um, communities who were really dependent on Chinese markets to, to find homes for the stuff. Um, and that was largely due to contamination. So they were pulling out too many dirty diapers, too many, you know, um, plastic bags, too many non-recyclable, somewhat dangerous things. Um, and they were coming all the way from the United States to China and they were ripping them open and finding that, you know, a third of the stuff that they were getting, they couldn't even use. So I don't blame them one bit for wanting to pull out of that market and, uh, and remove themselves from being a dumping ground for the rest of the world. Um, but it does really encourage people to reflect on their consumption and disposal methods and try to, you know, find more domestic solutions for their waste. Um, so we were really lucky. A lot of this stuff goes to places in Alabama, you know, sometimes Pennsylvania, sometimes Massachusetts. Um, if you have questions, you know, kind of a little bit more about that, I can put folks in touch with our, um, you know, recycling manager. Those are the folks who are brokering this material, trying to find the right homes for it. Um, and, and a lot of it is dependent on how much do we have? Um, you know, what is the market value for it? Maybe if we hold on to it a little bit longer, as a nonprofit, we really need to find ways to save money. And, um, and, you know, eventually when markets are good and we're getting a lot of money for the material, we could actually sell it and then give our towns, you know, a free recycling service again. Um, Cause we've been away from that for a long time. So, you know, hopefully we'll see that turn around, but they're the ones that broker that material and just try to find the best place to get rid of it um, so that it can be turned into new and useful things. 
Um, but we have followed those end markets too. And we, we feel very confident that the, the folks that we're working with are doing their due diligence and, and taking care of the stuff. All right, I'll keep going and um, I'm almost done with the tour. So thankfully we're, we're kind of getting there. All right, so from all, sorting all of these different commodities, now we gotta get them ready to sell to New York and Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and Alabama and all of these other places. Um, so we put them into our baler, which is actually the baler that we used to use for trash before we had waste to energy. Um, we used to bail up our trash and send that to the landfill. Um, thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. So we're using these balers, we're repurposing and recycling them for our facility. Um, that bale of cardboard here is about two, you know, one to two tons. So anywhere from 2000 to 4,000 pounds, a very heavy stuff. Um, but they are giving us a visual inspection and once he sees if there's anything in there that it doesn't belong. So in this case, he found some plastic bags. Um, he's going to pull out a, a grain bag in a minute. But a lot of that stuff, he's going to give us a quality control inspection because if it looks like it's trash, it's likely, you know, that we need to deal with that now so that we're not selling trash to other people. Um, so he gives those an inspection when they look good. They, they look like they're what they're supposed to be. Um, then we store them for a bit. And coincidentally, we've got footage of truck day. Um, so this is the day where we're gonna send um, all of these bales to find a new home somewhere else. Some examples of uh, materials that you can recycle and turn them into new and awesome things. Um, your newspapers have lots of recyclable potential. Um, they can turn into phone books, they can turn into egg cartons. Um, if you have a desk calendar at home, usually the really sturdy base of that is made from recycled fiber. Um, you can even see the fibers in that. Um, I've actually gotten kind of in the habit of recycling my own paper at home. So ripping up my junk envelopes and putting them into a blender, getting the pulp and, um, and making my own paper. So that's been really fun um, and a good way for me to kind of recycle where I'm at, uh, dealing with my own waste in my own house and turning it into something useful that I can, that I can use over and over again. Um, your metal can ultimately be infinitely recycled into all sorts of stuff. Um, our metal cans can turn into cars or, or, or um, steel beams for a building for new construction. Um, they can be melted down and reused over and over. Um, the plastics are a little bit more tricky. So, you know, you can turn plastic milk and juice bottles into new plastic bottles, um, but you can also turn them into, you know, other more long-term projects. So you can turn them into plastic lumber, uh, which can make Adirondack chairs, um, you know, picnic tables, you know, all sorts of cool stuff. You've got um, a playground in South Portland at Willard Beach that's actually made entirely out of recycled milk jugs. And even the nuts and bolts and stuff are made out of recycled metals as well. So really cool recycling example just out in our community. So if you're ever hanging out by Willard Beach, you can check out um, the playground made from milk jugs. Um, but there's lots of applications there, but they are limited. So there are some types of recycling that you can do over and over and over again. And there are some types of recycling that you can only really do once or twice. Um, so being mindful of that is really helpful as well. All right. And so we're coming back to the results of that quiz. Um, so items like our paper clips and bottle caps, um, they, you know, while they may be made from recyclable material, Unfortunately, in our facility, they're just too small. Um, so what will happen with those items is that they just fall through all of our equipment and litter our floor, and then they can never really find their home in the plant. Um, so unfortunately, those ones can't go into the single sort recycling equipment. Milk cartons and laundry detergent jugs are absolutely recyclable. Our milk cartons are made from uh, uh, paper. They do have a plastic lining on them. Um, which will need to be removed. That's a residue that they're gonna have to dispose of, um, but they can get the pulp out of those milk cartons and turn it into brand new paper. Um, laundry detergent jugs are made of a really good plastic. HDPE is pretty sturdy. It has a really great market value um, and gets recycled into all sorts of cool stuff. Um, we even have Frisbees that we, we table with and we show to kids all the time that are made from recycled laundry detergent jugs. And it's nice that those can become things that aren't just single use plastics. So that's really helpful. Um, individual plastic lids behave like paper. They're light, fluffy, and flat. 
And if they're by themselves, they get kind of sorted in with our paper and then we have plastic in our paper bales, which is not good for our buyers. Um, alkaline batteries, not, not a great one. Um, those are actually kind of free riders in the system right now. They, they shouldn't be put in those um, rechargeable battery recycling because they're made from different components. Um, we actually have to advise folks to throw them away at the, at the current moment. Um, they're safe, they're, you know, safe to, for us to burn. Um, not ideal, we, we'd love to see a solution for those to be recovered if we could. Um, but, you know, unfortunately in our facility, they could spark a charge and start a fire, not helpful. Um, magazines are recyclable. We got 100% on that. Um, those ones are just made of, you know, glossy paper, totally good to recycle. Um, coffee cups, they're paper, again, kind of like our milk cartons, they might have a little plastic liner in them, um, which can be removed to recycle and, and recover the pulp from the paper. Um, and pots and pans are actually recyclable in EcoMain's facility. Um, a lot of places might not take them because they're bulky. Um, you can put them in a scrap metal bin um, if, if that's the case, uh, but we do take them in our facility. Um, they just get pulled out manually before they go through the equipment. So thank you for participating in the poll. That was really, it's good information to see. And um, I always like to get your feedback on what you think you know, is recyclable and what's not. Um, if you ever have questions about which bin do I put this item in, EcoMain has got some really awesome resources for you. Um, the first one is our rule of plastics. So plastic, not all plastics are created equally. Not all plastics are recyclable, unfortunately. And a lot of plastics have the symbol on them that are not recyclable. So that can be kind of misleading for folks as well. So we have three question tests that you have to ask yourself before you can recycle an item in our plastics. Um, the first one is, does it have that symbol? Um, we need to see the resin code to know where to sort it. Um, and so it has to have that symbol on it to be recyclable. It also has to be a rigid plastic. So the plastic has to be hard and sturdy and keep its shape. Um, so example, plastic bags don't keep their shape. You can rip them, stretch them, crumple them all the way up in your hand. Um, but things like plastic water bottles are a lot easier. They keep their shape and they can get sorted correctly in our plant. Um, the last question is, is the item a container? So for that example of the plastic lid um, by itself, kind of floating up in our paper sorting screen, um, it's not a container, so it doesn't have that three-dimensional shape that we need. Um, we also can't take items like plastic toys. Um, so those kinds of things are just clunky. They're, they're bulky. They're really hard to chop up in a facility um, and, and repurpose that plastic into something new and useful. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not recyclable somewhere. It just means that we can't take them in our facility. Um, if you're still not sure, we have an online database with over 1,300 items called the Recyclopedia. You can get it right on your smartphone or you can go to ecomain.org slash 101. Um, and it's like the Google search. You just type in an item um, and we'll tell you what the best way to dispose of that item is. Um, and it's also multi-step. So, you know, let's say you put in food waste. Um, now you might have access to composting. That's gonna be the preferred method of disposal. Um, but if you don't, then, you know, we have other steps for you. All right. And now we're going to transition to talking about why we can't recycle our way out of this problem. You know, it's, it's a large problem. Recycling is only a very small part of that solution. Um, and we really need some top-down support to really make recycling systems more successful, to reduce the strain on landfills and disposal programs in general. Um, and we need your help to make sure that this happens, but we can't do it alone. Consumers can't do it alone. Um, you know, recyclers can't do it alone. We're kind of just reacting to the problem when the problem could really be changed from a higher up perspective. So um, this is where some policy comes into play and why you're all here, I'm sure. So again, just as a reminder, I, I don't like to start off with the doom and gloom and sometimes I do. So just as a reminder, before we had waste to energy technology, which burns the trash, turns it into, you know, ash, reduces the strain on landfills, but also turns it into energy. Um, and before we had recycling systems that repurposed the material, all of our waste took up space in landfills. Um, I have heard lots of stories before my time of people using barrels in their backyard to burn their trash. 
Um, and so those strategies were not very long term because we're polluting the air, we're polluting our land. Um, and it's and it's just a short term way of dealing with the problem. And it never really addresses the real problem, which is that we have an overflowing bathtub of waste and the tap is still on. So we've got to turn off the tap or slow it down. Um, I've used this metaphor a couple of times in presentations with Environment Maine, and it always just resonates so well. If we have an overflowing bathtub, we just got to turn down the tap and it makes it so much easier to clean up from there. Um, so there are lots of issues with landfilling. Using that space just to store trash is one of them, but we're also dealing with really powerful greenhouse gases that are being released into the air um, through methane emissions when organic waste starts to break down in a landfill. We're also dealing with you know, contaminated water, lots of um, leachate that could contaminate groundwater if we're not careful. Um, we're also talking about pests and vectors that you know, we've basically kicked them out of their home, put in a bunch of trash, and now we're, we're dealing with ecosystem disruptions there. Um, and then there's a cost to landfilling and it's very expensive. Um, I mean, we're talking millions and millions of dollars to buy land, put in all the right environmental protections in place, and then monitor and manage that landfill forever. It's not done once it closes. We still have to continue to monitor and deal with these things in the years after a landfill is done. So our job is never really done when we worry about landfills. So we need some better solutions. So another pop quiz, and this is just one, I'm gonna spoil it right away. Um, so I want you to think about how many years it might take to fill all of Maine's open landfills if we continue to throw things away at the same rate. Um, feel free to put your answer in the chat if you have a guess that you wanna share, um, but I'm getting ready to spoil it. So we've got 16 years, 22 years, 29 years, or 43 years. How long do you think we have with our landfills? All right, and then five, four, three, two, one. We've got about 22 years left in our landfills in the state of Maine. And um, this is actually using data that I've kind of manipulated from the DEP's landfill disposal and capacity report. Um, this is the old report too, so it's not even reflecting the new data and, and you know, hopefully this rate hasn't gotten any higher um, since then, but they just released the new report. So I haven't had time to edit this slide yet. But essentially using that data, I kind of calculated, this is where we're at in terms of open landfill space in 2020. This is where we'll be in 2040 to 2045. We're looking at closure of all of Maine's landfills by 2042. So at that point, where's our stuff gonna go? We don't really have a good solution for that yet. So again, with the overflowing bathtub, the landfill can only take so much of it. We have to find better solutions from the top down, which is where you guys come in and we come in and all of us need to work together. Um, so this is the waste hierarchy. This was established by the EPA back in the 80s as um, you know, a list of priorities for how to dispose of waste. So that reduce, reuse, recycle is a really cute little catchy mantra, but it means so much more. It means a lot of action to really look at the heart of where we're making the most trash and to do everything we can to reduce the amount that we're making, reuse the stuff we already have that's already out there in the world, recycle and then compost and waste to energy um, solutions for the rest. So one of the, you know, our mission statement really does kind of describe us very nicely. Um, we provide comprehensive long-term solid waste solutions. We're not just throwing stuff in a hole in the ground um, in a safe, environmentally responsible and economically sound manner. Because it's great if we can do all this stuff, but not if we bankrupt ourselves and have to close. Um, we also are a leader in raising public awareness of sustainable waste management strategies. So that's where, you know, our education team comes in and our advocacy comes in. Um, we really need to be the leaders in this situation to help, you know, kind of voice the concerns of the public. We talk and hear your stories all the time. We need to be an advocate for you in Augusta um, and with our producers that we work with and, um, you know, all of that stuff. So when we're talking about, um, you know, trying to minimize the amount of waste that we're dealing with, we hear your voices, we hear your concerns, and we're trying to advocate the best strategies for you. All right. So part of this is to close the loop. So cl closed loop system is when everyone's kind of working together and we've got a really good relationship going. But right now it's a little bit off 
because the design and the the creation of the packaging doesn't really work together with the disposal and the end of life of the packaging. So right now, like I said before, we're kind of reacting to the situation where new packages come on the market and we're made aware of them after they're already here. Um, and so we're just trying to pick up the pieces and figure out, can we manage this material? Or is this material that we have to throw away? You know, can we get equipment that can sort it correctly? Um, it's all very reactionary. Um, which is not very helpful if we're trying to reduce the strain on landfills and this infrastructure. Um, so we need to really be working together with producers, with manufacturers, with consumers to make sure they have the education and the tools that they need to know where to throw these things. Um, then, you know, working with collection and disposal processing. So, you know, we know what the mills will take and, and the facilities that take our stuff. We want to make sure we're playing by their rules, but we're also making sure that the producers are playing by their rules too. So they're making things that we can recycle and the folks after us can manage too. Um, so it's got to be a collaborative partnership and we're all a piece of that puzzle. All right, and there are lots of reasons why this benefits Maine. I'm sure you can think of quite a few. Um, it would reduce contamination in our facilities. If we have some accountability from producers to manufacture stuff that we can actually accept, um, you know, then, then that symbol actually means something. When you put a symbol on something, then you know, folks are less confused about you know, which bin it should go in. Um, so better labeling would be really helpful. Um, and I'm gonna show a picture in the next slide, I think about this one. Um, it also creates better recycling infrastructure. So if, the, if producers are responsible somewhat for the end of life, they're gonna make sure that there's infrastructure available to dispose of that stuff and make sure it gets put to a better and higher use. Um, it also incentivizes them to you know, eliminate unnecessary packaging. If they, if they don't really need it, they have an incentive not to make it. Um, it also can save taxpayer money. Um, so if, if right now in this system, you know, our facilities and all of these other facilities are paid for by taxpayer money in their solid waste and recycling budgets. Um, and so that might not be the case if producers are able to kind of financially cover some of those costs um, ahead of time for the end of life of their products. Um, we don't really have a lot of control over, you know, how to make them and make them recyclable, um, but the producers sure do. So if they have a financial responsibility to that, um, then it saves you money because then they're paying for, you know, it to go to recycling instead of you. Um, it also can improve recycling markets because they're making stuff that can be easily recycled um, and improves the value of those materials. Uh, it also improves coordination between, you know, the towns who are trying to collect and manage this stuff and the producers themselves who are making the packaging. So there's a little bit more um, collaboration there. And then defining readily recyclable. So, um, you know, across the state, there are different rules on how to recycle things. So we want to be all on the same page about what's recyclable and what's not. And so these kinds of policies could really help us do that. All right, and this is my slide on why labeling is really important. Um, this one right here is Renew Liner. It comes in a lot of uh, meal delivery kits. It's uh, made from number one plastic and it says right on there, place me in your curbside recycling bin. But unfortunately we can't sort that correctly in our facility because it acts just like paper. Um, so if they saw our facility and knew this is how we sort out paper and we do that the first thing in the facility, um, then maybe they would understand why we can't recycle those. Um, but that messaging is very confusing for consumers. We also see that kind of messaging on plastic bags um, and styrofoam and, you know, our plastic mailers. Some of these are labeled really well. This is actually kind of a good example. Um, our Amazon Prime labels tell you to bring that right back to the retailers to be recycled in the plastic film drop off. Um, and it, it's got all sorts of details. Take the paper label off before you put it in the recycle bin. This is actually a model, a model label and hopefully what we could have in the future. Um, but we see all sorts of mislabels and mis, you know, kind of conflicting information on packages all the time. All right. So three things you can do to help us today. Um, I've got three and I'm going to turn it over for Anya to share her three too, and then we'll turn it over for questions. Um, so if you're not sure where your recycling goes, um, I know I, I have my map of my eco main towns, but if you don't live in one of those towns and you're not sure, um, check your town's website, 
call your town office, check in with your public works department and find out. Um, because it's really important that you know the rules and you're clear on where your stuff is going and how it's being managed um, and, and holding those people accountable too. Um, this, the second one is to download the Recyclopedia. If you're in our towns, um, that's going to be a lifesaver. It's going to tell you where all your stuff should go um, and give you some options if you're, if you, you're stuck on an item and you're not really sure, how do I get rid of a mattress? How do I get rid of propane tanks? Um, we'll put you in the right direction. And then the last one is to contact your local decision makers. So if you've got uh, representatives in your community, please reach out to them, ask them to support bills and um, you know, legislation that encourages reduction of waste and, and encourages the recycling of waste in the state of Maine. You know, we want to put less burden on landfilling, a lot less burden on recycling systems who are also dealing with a lot of this contamination because people are confused. Um, we want to push for good policy that really helps, um, you know, reduce waste, turn off that tap, um, but also makes it easier for recyclers to continue doing the job that they love so much. All right. And Anya can tell you her action items. Sure. Uh, they overlap a bit with eco mains uh, because at this point, what we really need to do is pass policy uh, to make this change at a policy level. Um, and uh, we are in a great place because we do have a producer responsibility for packaging bill that uh, has been submitted to the legislature. Uh, it actually was submitted last year. There was a lot of support uh, for the bill. Unfortunately, the legislature adjourned early. Uh, so we introduced it or we've submitted it again this year. Uh, and so one of the best things you can do is to call your state legislator and urge them to vote yes and support producer responsibility for packaging for Maine. Unfortunately, the bill itself has not been printed yet. So uh, we can't mention a specific bill number, but asking them to support generally producer responsibility for packaging in Maine will make a difference. Uh, you can also contact your municipal officials and ask them, ask your city or your town to adopt a resolution to support the recycling reform in your town. So uh, one thing that's helpful is, is making sure that, that our legislators see that uh, the municipalities are on board with this as well. Um, that and then also asking local businesses to to raise their voice and you know let people know that they're on board with this they they want this as well um and then last signing our petition calling for producer responsibility in maine you can go to our website uh, i'll also be sending that link in our follow-up email um, so those are the sweet three easy things you can do today Awesome. And so the last slide has our contact information. If you have questions about this or anything that lingers after the session, please reach out to us. Um, also follow us on social media if you're not already doing that, because we'll give you updates on, you know, things that are happening in the recycling industry or from, from Environment Maine's perspective, ways to get involved and, and advocate on behalf of um, your community. So please feel free to reach out. You've got all of the information you need there um, to get in touch with us and, and contact us directly. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yes, following us on social media, making sure that you're signed up for our emails, uh, get on our mailing list, because once that bill comes out, there will be public hearings and we will need people like you, constituents, to attend those public hearings, present that testimony, and let our legislators know that this is something that Mainers support. So please keep an eye on that. Um, we do have some questions that haven't yet been answered, and I know that it is one o'clock. Uh, I think we're going, we're able to stay maybe a few minutes over, if that's okay. Uh, so for those of you who want to we want to stay on for a few minutes. We'll try to get to a couple more questions. Uh, otherwise, if we don't get to your question, I will have them saved and uh, we will make a list of them and answer them and send them out to you afterwards as well because I know that there are a few specific questions. And keep in mind that anything having to do with what and how to recycle things can be found on Ecomain's Recyclopedia. It's a really, really great resource. Like she said, it's basically like Google. Um, so a couple questions. Uh, one that I saw is uh, asking about, so EcoMain has been able to recycle, you know, you, you take numbers one through seven, um, but some stations, you know, don't, uh, don't only take, you know, um, 
certain numbers. And so the question is, why can't you know those other places find the markets that you have, or why don't they take those? Yeah, and so some of it, it there's I think there's a few answers here. Um, so some of it is volume. So EcoMain processes recycling and solid waste for a third of the state's population. Um, so we are managing a lot of recycling, which opens up a lot of doors for us in terms of, you know, we're making enough bales to sell on our own um, to these manufacturers. Uh, whereas a small town's transfer station um, is usually, you know, they usually create their own little bales, but they don't generate as much. Um, and they partner, you know, maybe to consolidate with other towns to, to market this material. Um, so that, you know, adds its own level of challenge where for us, you know, our partnerships have been with plastic manufacturers in the United States for a long time. Um, so we've had kind of a longstanding relationship with these buyers. Um, and it makes it easier for us to broker these materials when we need to. Um, so that's one reason. And another reason is, you know, we're really lucky we're a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to landfill diversion. Um, you know, our, like I said, our municipal, um, you know, board of directors, the folks from our towns are really committed to making sure that we have a local solution for our waste for a long time. Um, and so part of that means that sometimes it's more affordable to just throw something in a landfill than it is to recycle it. But we won't do that because it's not the long term sustainable solution that we need. We know that in the long term, if we throw things in a hole in the ground and, and deal with them later, um, that we're going to be paying for that tenfold. Um, so that commitment is there now in the short term because we want to be here for the long term. So there's a little bit of, a you know, kind of a combination answer there. And I'm sure there are other reasons. Um, but I think the, you know, the market value just sometimes isn't there for all the different types of plastics. Sometimes you have to pay to recycle them um, because you have to, you get such little value for the material. Um, just, you know, and I think some of that is contingent on oil prices too, because plastics are a petroleum product. And so when petroleum prices and oil prices are low, it's more competitive and, and it makes more sense to buy virgin plastic than it does to buy recycled plastic. So there's less incentive there for buyers to invest in recycling. Um, so, so some of that plays in, in as well. Um, so when the value of plastics are low, um, you know, some facilities just can't financially make that justification, um, you know, unless the demand is there. So again, another reason to advocate and if everyone is calling their town office and saying, hey, why aren't you taking, you know, number five plastics? Why aren't you taking all of these other types of materials? Then maybe they'll see the value um, from their, you know, from a taxpayer standpoint saying that maybe, you know, taxpayers are willing to pay a little bit more if it means that they can recycle more materials. Um, so that's another opportunity for advocacy there too. Absolutely. And I will also add on that, you know, because there are, some plastics, you know, just really have no demand and therefore places can't accept them. That's another reason to advocate for producer responsibility. Uh, you know, if the if the corporations that are producing these plastics make, you know, only materials that are actually recyclable and of use, then there are less likely to be these, these other plastics that um, we can't bring to our curbside recycling or that, you know, aren't profitable or marketable. So exactly. So that's really where, you know, recycling reform or extended producer responsibility could really help us um, because, you know, they, the state or some agency will determine what's recyclable across the state and what's not. And so it'll drive, um, you know, a financial incentive to manufacturers to make their packaging in something that is readily recyclable. So something that could be recycled in your town if you can't currently recycle, you know, a number five plastic or a number seven plastic or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so it makes it easier um, for those towns and a little bit more equitable too, so that those costs are reimbursed, um, especially with the fact that more rural towns and more, um, you know, Northern communities have to transport a lot of their material quite a long ways to be processed. So that cost could potentially be reimbursed in this system. Um, and so it makes it a little bit more equitable for, for everyone around the state to participate and not just the folks in Portland or, you know, the folks in Augusta who are, um, it makes it a little bit easier for everyone to recycle and recycle better. That's right. And uh, do one more question. Uh, 
someone is asking uh, if how it works with uh, the producers paying. So whether they will pay part of the town's taxes, you know, or if the producer has to pay a fee if they don't produce the more easily recycled materials. Uh, so that's a good question. Um, so basically uh, the producers themselves will pay into the municipalities um, and the programs that they're doing. So they'll pay into that directly. It's not like a, they're charged a fee if they aren't producing certain kinds of plastic. So, you know, right now, uh, Maine's taxpayers are paying between 16 and 17 and a half million dollars per year to manage packaging waste, either through recycling or disposal. And so, um, you know, this would cut down significantly on that. Um, and, you know, a lot of that burden is on the cities and towns. Um, and they're forced to, to choose between raising taxes or, or cutting recycling programs, that sort of thing. So um, having the funding come from the producers themselves will ease that, uh, that, that impetus, that, um, that weight on municipalities and taxpayers. Um, so that will go directly to the towns. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Vanessa. No, I think you covered it nicely. <laughs> All right, great. Um, and then uh, we have some questions about um, what happens to plastic uh, that can't be recycled. Uh, so I think you sort of covered this, um, but you know, when you're sorting out and pulling out things that can't be recycled, what is happening with that plastic? Yeah, so contamination, um, especially, I mean, that that plastic waste, like the plastic films and strapping and all of that stuff that we cannot recycle or sell to other folks, um, that contamination, that residue is being pulled out manually and it's being brought to our waste to energy facility. So it does, you know, it does at least end up in this facility rather than just getting buried in a hole. Um, but yeah, I mean, Id ideally, you know, we'd rather it just not get stuck in the equipment or, or, you know, be at risk of, of ripping one of our conveyor belts. Those are really expensive repairs and a lot of wear and tear on our equipment and a lot of time lost, um, you know, that we could be recovering more recycling. Um, so to, to have to shut down the facility for two hours while we go and cut out all the plastic bags, um, that's a lot of lost time that we could have been, you know, managing recyclables. So it does end up in their waste to energy facility and we'd rather it end up there in the first place. Um, but there are uh, some other alternatives and I know someone asked about plastic films um, in particular. There are some product stewardship programs in place right now for material like that. So your plastic grocery bags, for example, um, if you have them, I know with COVID, I ended up with a lot more plastic bags than I'm used to. Um, because my retailers weren't letting me bring in my own bags. Um, and until I figured out my strategy of, you know, bringing in a cardboard box and just stuffing everything in a cardboard box, um, I, I was getting waste that I didn't really ask for or want. Um, so those plastic films, for example, can be recycled, but only in the right, you know, facility. It can only go to the, it has to go to the right place. So for example, the grocery bags, um, you can bring those right back to the retailers. That's actually a state statute in the state of Maine right now. Um, retailers are obligated to have a container to recycle plastic films if they are giving them to you in the first place. So places like Hannaford and Target and Walmart and Shaw's, um, a lot of these big major retailers um, that you know may be giving you those plastic bags, even if they're giving you just produce bags, um, they have to have a container in their store um, per state statute um, to recycle that stuff and have a recycler in place to take that material to turn it into something new. Um, so for example, I know Hannaford works with companies like Trex Decking um, and Trex makes composite decking, um, you know, and outdoor furniture and stuff from recycled plastic bags and other types of plastic material. So, um, so that's one option. But again, if we can refuse that plastic bag, that's ideal. We want to encourage, you know, cut it out at the source if we can and refuse that plastic as much as possible. Same deal with like plastic straws, for example, which are not recyclable and they're just meant to be used for five minutes and then thrown in the trash. Yeah, thanks Vanessa. And I will um, wrap it up with just another note on that. Uh, you know, as Vanessa said, ideally, yes, you know, a lot of these products can be recycled in some way, but at the end of the day, you know, the plastic that can't be recycled, even if it's, you know, if it's incinerated, if it's put into a landfill or, you know, 
flies away into the air and gets stuck in a tree. Either way, it's it's remaining in our environment and in our atmosphere. Um, so the real solution here is to turn off that tap um, or at least almost turn it off. So um, a couple of things to note, uh, the plastic bag ban and the polystyrene ban that Vanessa mentioned earlier, uh, they've already, the an date that they are supposed to go into effect has already been moved for both of them. So uh, it's gonna be really important to make sure that those laws go fully into effect, um, holding your legislators accountable to make sure that that doesn't get moved. There are also three bills currently uh, in the legislature that are seeking to repeal the plastic bag ban. So calling your legislators and urging them to vote against that repeal uh, would be very important um, because we need to make sure that we are reducing the plastic bags that are out there. I don't know about you, but I took a walk um, just the other day around uh, the back bay and, and it was just covered in plastic bags. And so, um, you know, that's where they're really, it's really getting into our environment, um, you know, and not only messing with our views of the beautiful ocean, but also, you know, it's being found more and more in animals and in humans, so. Big call to reach out to your legislators. Um, with that, I think we are going to wrap up for today. Thank you so much to those of you who stayed on a bit longer. Uh, as I said, we are gonna take a look at all the questions that were submitted today and do our best to answer that uh, after the fact. Um, and if you have any other questions, again, here's our contact info. Feel free to reach out to either Vanessa or myself um, and visit uh, our websites, Environment Maine, also has, uh, we have a recent report from last December called Break the Waste Cycle that has more information on producer responsibility and why it's great for Maine. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Um, and thanks for talking trash. Oh, and also uh, we are going to have two more parts to this webinar series. Uh, so keep an eye out in your email and our social media for more information on those events. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.